My name is Sam Powell, and this is my lovely wife, Cynthia. Uh, it is an honor for us to be able to introduce to you today our workshop on gender roles uh, in the church. Uh, this is a very important topic because we need to know and understand God's plan and God's will for structure in his church. Uh, Jesus said in John 7, verse 17, If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. And our objective is obviously to do God's will, to choose God's will. What is God's will and what do the scriptures teach on women's role in the church? Are we obeying the word and following the biblical principles and guidelines? Are there things we need to examine and possibly change? Are we continuing to grow in our understanding of God's word and God's will on this vital topic? Uh, David said in Psalm 119 verse 18, he said, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your word. And that is our prayer today, is that God will open our eyes and open our hearts to see what his word is saying to us uh, today. Uh, this is an opportunity, a great opportunity, an opportunity for us to learn and grow. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to have greater unity in the church. It's an opportunity for us to thwart Satan's plan to divide and confuse. Uh, it's also an opportunity for us as the body of Christ to be a light to the world and to give glory to our God. And so today, we want to make the most of this opportunity. It's great getting to be a part of this much needed workshop. Some of us have had questions and concerns about the role of women in the church. Our aim is to speak to some of those concerns today. Men and women in our fellowship of churches have spent countless hours studying God's word, praying, meeting together, and discussing what you will hear today. Those who have met in these various discussion groups include our kingdom teachers, ministry staff members from our New York and New Jersey region of churches, our elders, along with their wives. During these meetings, these men and women have taken a deep dive into the scriptures and other relevant resources to help come to a better understanding of God's perspective on gender roles in the church. Through this process, I have certainly been learning and seeing things in God's word that I did not understand as clearly before as I do now. So we want to encourage all of us uh, to open wide our hearts today. Uh, to not be set in our ways, but to allow the Spirit of God to speak to us, to guide us, and maybe to teach us some new things. Uh, no one has all the answers uh, to uh, this topic of gender. Uh, in the past, it has divided individuals, it has divided churches, and we want uh, to fulfill the prayer of Jesus. But Jesus says in John 17, I have given them the glory, Father, that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And so that's the prayer that, that we're imitating and wanting to put into practice. Uh, Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. What a high calling. And what does it take to get there? It takes a lot of humility. Uh, it takes a, a heart that's willing to uh, be open and to learn and to embrace new things. And that's our aim today. Our hope and prayer is that all of us will have a learner's heart as we look at the scriptures together today. Mm -hmm. We are so thankful for the men and women who have invested their time to study out this vital topic. I am eager to hear all that God has put on their hearts to teach us today. So let's uh, commit this uh, workshop to prayer and uh, let's all grow together today. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us to know you and to know your word. Thank you for your church, uh, which God we know is the light of the world. And we pray today that through this workshop, uh, we can grow in our understanding of your will, especially as we consider this topic of gender roles. Uh, help us to uh, be united 
Help us to grow in our understanding. And we pray at the end of all of this, we can be a better people and a better church to your glory. Bless this time. Uh, we pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for attending our workshop, Women and Men Together for God's Glory. Dr. Steve Kennard is among the presenters, was very involved in planning today's workshop as well, and is one of the authors of the book, The Bible and Gender, which is the basis of this study. Since recording today's messages, Steve has faced the death of his son, Daniel. We express our deepest sympathy to Steve and Lee, and also to Daniel's sister, Chelsea Novak, and brother-in-law, Rob Novak. They all continue to be in our prayers. Also, if you have a question about something presented today, please do not reach out to Steve at this time, but instead direct any questions to your ministry leaders. Thanks again for joining us. Welcome to our workshop entitled Women and Men Together for the Glory of God. The goal of this workshop is twofold. Number one, to help us understand particular scriptures that discuss the role of gender in God's church. And number two, to speak to changes in our New York and New Jersey regions of the ICOC in regards to gender in worship, leadership, and marriage based on our study of scripture. We hope that this workshop will ensure that every disciple of Jesus will be able to use fully her or his gifts to the glory of God and to the building up of the church. Ultimately, we want to honor God. We want to honor God by making sure that all disciples of Jesus are being equipped to use their gifts to advance God's kingdom on earth. We will have four sessions that will be taught by various teachers on the topics of number one, the Imagio Dei, the image of God, number two, the assembly, number three, marriage, and number four, ecclesiastical leadership. Why this workshop? Because God loves humanity. God loves humanity with an unquenchable and ceaseless love. The ultimate expression of God's love for humanity was seen in God sending his son Jesus into the world to demonstrate his love through Jesus, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. God's love was also expressed in the movement of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of humans to direct them to record scripture for the edification and the instruction of humanity. God's wisdom is without limit. And in his wisdom, he created humans, both female and male. Gender is a God thing. Gender is part of God's good vision for the world. There are times when gender and scripture bump into each other and against each other in particular passages that speak specifically to the topic of gender. This occurs very, very early in the Bible when God created humans as both male and female in Genesis 2 and 3. There are passages of scripture that mention gender that are difficult to understand. What do we do with those passages that state that, for example, women ought to remain silent in the church, whereas another passage speaks to women praying and prophesying in the assembly? What do we do with the passage of scripture where Paul says that he does not permit a woman to teach a man, and another passage of scripture where Priscilla and her husband, Aquila, are teaching Apollos the way of Jesus more accurately. Plus, there is a battle in the evangelical world between scholars who hold opposite views on women and their roles in ministry and leadership. Ben Wetherington III writes, in reading through the ever-growing literature dealing with women in the Bible, one is constantly confronted with able scholars who nonetheless come to the text 
with a specific agenda in mind, whether patriarchal or feminist. This is not surprising in view of the importance of the issue, but when the Bible is used to justify positions which are polar opposites, one suspects that something has gone awry." End quote. Something has gone awry, and since we live in the church as female and male, it serves as Christians to see what God is saying to women and men in the Bible about gender, about roles, about leadership, and about ministry. Why are we presenting this workshop? Because we are a part of a global movement known as the International Church of Christ. And a few years back, our leaders in our churches realized that we need to take a closer look at what the Bible says about the role of gender in areas like assembly, worship, the ministry, and marriage, and ecclesiastical leadership. Not because the Bible changes, but because we need to seek to understand the Bible in a changing world around us. Because the Bible is living and active and can speak to culture throughout time. It can even say something to changing culture. Dorothy A. Lee in her book, The Ministry of Women in the New Testament states, quote, the, stat the church is not static. It is not strictly speaking, primarily an institute at all, but an organic body of faithful, God-serving people stretching across time and space. Belief in the Spirit's ongoing present in interpreting Scripture for new circumstances is part and parcel of Christian belief." End quote. We've made changes in our church culture in the recent past because we've been willing to take a fresh look at Scripture. For example, in 1993, the leadership of the ICOC gathered for a conference entitled Wine, Women, and Song. I was there, and I remember that conference vividly. Up to that point, our churches, which came into existence through the mainstream Church of Christ, practiced things that were like in including a total abstinence of alcohol, the exclusive use of a cappella, non-instrumental music in our worship, and a virtual absence of women participating in the worship assembly. But at that conference, we changed. We changed a basic principle that we had adopted from the mainstream Church of Christ. The principle was, where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we are silent. We changed that to where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we are allowed to speak. And we need to approach the Bible with humility understanding that the Bible doesn't change, but we do. God is perfect. We are not. The Bible does not fail, but we fail to understand and to accept and to apply it. There are times where we need to take a fresh look at our church culture and practice based on our study of Scripture, and we need to do this with humility. In 2018, some of the leaders of the ICOC asked the teacher service team to explore scriptures that pertain to women in the ministry, in the assembly, in marriage, and in ecclesiastical leadership. In the fall of that year, 2018, the teacher service team started a deep dive into this topic. We looked at nine passages of scripture. The study and the writing along that topic took two years and it yielded eight papers on nine passages of Scripture. This is what is known as community theology. Women and men were involved in this research and writing. Different teachers were assigned, or they selected different passages. Then we came together as a team and discussed each paper, making changes based on our discussion. Not every person agreed with every point in these papers. I didn't agree with everything in the papers, but we agreed to stay united in spite of our differences. We continue to be united in spite of our differences. We continue to love one another more than we love our opinions. Before being distributed, these papers were reviewed by a team of evangelists and elders 
and their wives from our churches. They sent their comments on the papers back to the teacher service team. And after a final edit, the papers were released to leaders in our churches. The papers were also collected into a book entitled The Bible and Gender, which was published in 2020. And parts of this presentation are based on those studies. After publication, the papers were then given to church leaders across the ICOC to review the practices within their church of women in the assembly, marriage, and ministry, and leadership. For example, our own Central Jersey church did their own study of the passages that speak to gender and implemented changes based on their study of Scripture. Throughout 2021, leadership in the New York City Church worked on this topic. First, a small team of women and men discussed how to research the topic in relation to our own local ministry. Second, a larger group of five women and four men spent over 30 hours of praying, meeting, and discussing the study of these passages and the teacher's papers in light of our local New York, New Jersey regions and the upstate churches as well. They offered their findings to the elders and their wives of the New York City Church and the Central Jersey Church. Now, during this workshop, the New York City Church and the Central Jersey Church and our churches in upstate New York will take a look at what has been discussed and then we'll speak to the changes we wish to implement in our churches based on our study of Scripture. The goal of this workshop is to exegete specific passages that speak to God's vision, the vision that God has for women and men in His church. At times, these passages are more specific to women, and at other times, the passages are more specific to men. Often, whether indirectly or directly, the roles of women and men are mentioned in the same passage. So in our workshop, we will take part in an inductive Bible study on several passages of Scripture. Be aware that these presentations are based on a deep Bible study. Some of the presenters began by exploring the text in its original language, whether that be Hebrew or that be Greek. They considered the cultural background and the occasional setting that led to the text being written. And then after looking at the text critically to see what the author meant to say to his original audience and what the original listeners or readers would have understood from the text, the authors move on to discuss what the text may or may not mean to us. So that's what we're doing as presenters. This discussion is text driven. You know, we claim to be a people of the book. If that is the case, then our discussion, our discussion on gender in the church must be a Bible-based discussion. It ought not to be a 21st century culture-driven discussion. Often when we try to account for our own biases, we, come, we still come to the Bible with many unintended lenses based on what we have experienced in our lives. This is why it is vital that we explore the Bible together with one another to try to see the text more clearly and allow it to address us in our current culture, community theology. Christianity is a global movement. Culture changes as we move from country to country. The goal of Bible study is to derive meaning from the text and apply it to the culture where we live. It is not to study our given culture and then make the text fit into that culture. We need to be students of the text and students of culture, but the text should inform our culture. So we start with the text, the Bible, and we trust the text. The goal of this workshop is to help students or readers of the Bible to interpret passages that speak to women and men in the ministry in the church. Not every passage on women and men will be treated here. Uh, there, that's for a wider study outside the scope of this workshop. For example, I wish we had time 
to present material on women in the ministry of Jesus. That's an informative and inspiring study. I'm doing that in our little region of the church right now. But we don't have time to do everything, so we have to pick and choose. We hope that this workshop offers help in interpreting some difficult passages of Scripture on the role of gender, leadership, and ministry for the glory of God and for the good of the church. We hope this workshop creates dialogue and discussion that will advance the kingdom of God on this earth. So this is what we're going to do. In our first session, we will explore Genesis 1 through 3, the Imagio Dei, the image of God. And John Markowski will lead that study. Next, we'll take a, take a deep dive into Pauline theology, and we will discuss 1 Corinthians 11 and 14, Galatians 3 and 1 Timothy 2. I will lead that study. Next, we will explore marriage and take a look at Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, and 1 Peter 3. And Bobby Ritter will lead that study. And then in our last discussion, I will present a study on 1 Timothy 4 and Titus 3. And we'll talk about and take a look at ecclesiastical leadership. In this last session, session four, some of our elders from New York and New Jersey will speak specifically about some changes we wish to see implemented in our congregations and our region based on our study of Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul admonishes the disciples in Ephesus to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We want to be unified as a people of God. Some of us might not agree with every point in this workshop, but let's talk. Let's discuss what is being presented. And let's decide that we want to make every effort to be unified in the Spirit. Our desire is for every disciple to use her or his gifts to the glory of God and for the benefit of Jesus' church. This is why we are taking this time to carefully explore the Scripture's together. This workshop isn't the end of the discussion. It's actually the beginning of the discussion. And as we continue to discuss this topic, let's remember the words of Jesus. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we embark on this study of your word, Give us humble and teachable hearts. We want to glorify you in our lives, in our worship, and in our ministry. We pray that every disciple of Jesus will be able to use her or his gifts for your glory and also to build up the church and to reach the world around us. Please be with us in a powerful way. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I heard a lot of nursery rhymes growing up. My name is John, so I got a healthy dose of John John the Leprechaun went to school with nothing on. Now I'm still dealing with the trauma on that one, so we'll move forward. My little brother's name is Peter, so he got a lot of Peter Peter pumpkin eater and I never really thought about what the words meant until later, as an adult. Think about it with me. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a wife and couldn't keep her. Say the rest with me. He put her in a pumpkin shell and there he kept her very well. So the headline on this children's rhyme is that it's Peter's wife was two time and so he killed her and buried her in a giant pumpkin shell. <laughs> Three blind mice, let's try that one. Three blind mice, see how they run. See how they run, all together now. They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut off their tails with a carving knife. Did you ever see such a sight in your life as three blind mice? So that's Bloody Queen Mary, who's the farmer's wife here. And the story was that she actually blinded and dismembered three church elders before burning them. And now we sing it to toddlers. Rockabye baby, I don't even wanna finish that one. 
Humpty Dumpty was actually a huge cannon in the English Civil War. Jack and Jill, well, they went up the hill. King Louis was beheaded, and his queen, Mary Antoinette's head, came tumbling after. Ring around the rosy, well, those ashes are from the cremation of bodies after they died from the plague. Sometimes we get so used to hearing something, we don't think about what it means anymore. This can happen with how we read the Bible. It's what David Foreman calls the lullaby effect. Now, what about Genesis 1, 2, and 3? For those of us who've been around the Bible or church for very long, those chapters ring pretty clear to us. Uh, God spoke the universe into existence. We got light and dark, land, sea, plants, animals. And then God made the first man, Adam. But he got lonely, so God took a rib out of his body and made Eve as a helper to him. And then the man goes on to rule paradise along with his wife, and they were naked without shame. And then, of course, from then on forward, all women will leave their families to be united to their husbands. Most of that sounds right, but it's not. There are some major problems. In his widely revered commentary on Genesis, Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann writes, the first chapters of Genesis are among the most important in scripture, and they are frequently the most misunderstood. Let's deconstruct four different lullaby effects in Genesis 1 through 3 together. The first lullaby is from Genesis 1, 26, usually translated as, let us make mankind in our image. Now, the issue is God actually didn't first make a man in Genesis 1. He made a human. Gender comes later. The Hebrew word in Genesis 1, 26 is Adam, not someone's name, not a proper noun, just a regular old noun. Now, I like Hebrew scholar Phyllis Tribble's translation for Adam, earth creature. And it's a Hebrew pun because the earth creature, Adam, is made from Adama, which means earth. Now, many of us have heard the phrase imago dei, which is just the Romanized or Latinized version of the phrase image of God from the Hebrew. So here are three translations describing what is made in the Imago Dei of Genesis 1.26. First, the NIV, let us make mankind in our image, okay? The NRSV, let us make humankind in our image. And then let's look lastly at the ESV, let us make man in our image. Now you can see there's a little footnote next to the word man in the ESV. And that footnote reads that the Hebrew word for man, Adam, is the generic term for mankind and becomes the proper name Adam later. So even though these English translations lead to a masculine reading, the Hebrew does not. Then what happens next? Well, in verse 27, God created Ha-Adam, the earth creature, or humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, and it says male and female, he created them. We go from the singular earth creature to the plural them, male and female, from one into two. And there's a lot of reasons why this is important. One of them is that, of course, we're all clear that God makes a person in his own image. But what's been confusing over the centuries is that people are unsure about the biblical equality of men and women from this passage. But the Hebrew is very straightforward. It doesn't say, and then God gave 70% of his image to the man and 30% of his image to the woman. No, God splits the one into two equal parts of his imago dei. There's a fancy phrase in the academy called reception history, and reception history um, studies how ancient texts are received or misreceived. And when examining the reception history of Genesis 1 through 3 on gender, it is crucial to understand the context in which these texts were received. Famous fourth century BC Greek philosopher Aristotle believed that women were actually unfinished men, that they were incomplete, that they were mutilated forms of men. In his politics, Aristotle writes, quote, the relation of male to female is by nature a relation of superior to inferior and ruler to be ruled, end quote. He believed women generated less heat in their bodies and therefore they had smaller brains, essentially stuck on their evolutionary progress. 
Aristotle writes that women are, quote, more jealous, more contentious, more subject to depression of spirit and despair than the male. She's also more shameless and false, more readily deceived, and on the whole, less excitable than the male. On the contrary, the male is more ready to help and, as it has been said, braver than the female, end quote. Did Aristotle even know any women? Aristotle even pushed for policies that rationed less food for women because in his mind, they were worth less. So imagine the early church filled with Jews and Gentiles who lived in this Greco-Roman world where the fathers of philosophy were revered. In fact, in John 1, John calls Jesus the Logos, which was actually Plato's word in his philosophy 400 years earlier. So Aristotle's misogyny, among many others, influenced the reception history of Genesis 1 through 3 on gender in the first century church. So much so, in fact, that a subculture of inequality had already been well embedded by the time of Jesus and into the early church, which is where we'll meet another man with women issues named Jerome, but we'll get to him in lullaby number four. For now, lullaby number two. Let's talk about the lullaby of the word translated helper. In the NIV in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, if you've been around Arlene or I for every length, any length of time, you've heard the word azer. Because when you hear the word helper, you will typically think of something like an assistant, like Adam's secretary. Maybe we can imagine some kind of conversation between Adam and his wife early in the garden. Uh, okay, honey, I'm naming that wild looking thing over there, um, rhinoceros. Uh, Eve, did you catch that? Please write that down and make sure there's an H in there somewhere, right? We sort of imagine that maybe being the case, maybe not. But no, Azer's not like that at all. It's not that kind of help. The word Azer appears in scripture 21 times and 77% of those times, the word Azer is used to describe none other than God himself. In Exodus 18.4, it says that God was my Azer and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. In Deuteronomy 33, 29, it talks about being an azer against my enemies. In Psalm 121 and verse 2, my azer comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So in just a few scriptures, you can see the kind of strength this word embodies. An azer is a maker, a rescuer, a warrior. Now, we're not going to swing the pendulum and say women are like God and men are not. Both genders are created in the Imago Dei. Now remember, the whole of creation up to this point, we're getting, it's good, it's good, it's very good. But then all of a sudden, it's not. There's a creation disruptor. Here in Genesis 2.18, for the very first time, something is not good. It is not good for the Ha-Adam to be alone. And what is Yahweh's answer? Well, in Genesis 2.18, it reads, I will make for it a companion corresponding to it my reading from the Hebrew. Let's break down why. We have this word azer, and now there's another word here, konegdo. Azer konegdo. And we see this phrase again in verse 20, because the animals are not necessarily a corresponding image of the divine. We know what azer is. What about this word konegdo? It's made of two words. The ka is a preposition, uh, like or as or to. And then the negdo is from neged, which in Hebrew means in front of, opposite to or corresponding. We can see the use of this phrase uh, throughout the Bible, especially in the early Hebrew scriptures. In Genesis 31, 37, they put the household items before or in the presence of the neged of my family. In Deuteronomy 31, 11, the law was read in front of or before all of Israel. In Genesis 21, 16, Hagar sat opposite Ishmael. And then finally, in Genesis 33, 12, Esau said, let us journey on our way and I will go alongside you, Neged, from Konegdo. If you put the whole phrase together, Azer Konegdo, what we see here is a help corresponding, a warrior partner, or a mirror counterpart to Adam. You know, the rabbis used to use two two by fours to illustrate Azer Konegdo because one of their translations was that it was a help that opposes. 
When you first hear that, you get worried. Wait a minute, oppose? What could that mean? Well, think about these two by fours. If you set them up in tension, like a triangle from the ground, that's actually the only way that they will stand solid. They must be equal parts. If one is not equal to the other, they will fall. And this doesn't just apply to the marriage relationship. This is a theology of the genders for all male-female relationships under God's design. So, lullaby one, is man preeminent? No. Lullaby two, is woman a lesser assistant? No. Now lullaby number three, ribs and bones. In Genesis 2, 21 and 22, we get the Hebrew word salah. It's usually translated as rib in our English Bibles. And our lullaby here is that God grabbed this seemingly extraneous bone from the man's body and constructed the woman. But that misses the nuance of the Hebrew, which more likely refers to one side of the body, not just a particular rib. It's kind of like one side of the pizza has got pepperoni and the other side is mushroom. It's like half of something. In Exodus 25, 12, it reads two rings on the one side, salah of it, and then two rings on the other side, salah. In 1 Kings 6.34, there are two leaves of the one door that were folding to Salah from one hole. So God takes one side of Ha'adam to construct woman, not from the head above, which would be dominant, not from the foot below, which would be subservient, but split from the side, Salah, which is equal. Then in the next verse in 2.23, the Ish, the man sees the Isha, the woman, and says, whoa, bone of my bones, etzem. In the Hebrew lexicon, etzem is exactness, a parallel, a sameness. Etzem is also a person's vigor or substance. As if the Ha'adam is seeing the mirror of his own DNA. The point is, they're made of the same stuff. In Genesis 7:13, we see the word etzem as the very same, as a measure of time, that very same day. What's more, it's a Hebrew tradition for the bride to leave her family and join her husband in marriage. But that's not what Genesis says. Actually, quite the opposite. The man will leave his family and be united to his wife. Even here, the Debar Yahweh, the word of God, does not obey cultural cues, but sets its own moral law. In this case, perfect gender equality. Number one, the earth creature, not man. Lullaby two, the counterpart, not helper. Lullaby three, the other side, a mirror image, not an extra rib and bones. And now the fourth and final lullaby. In the punishments of Genesis three, after the sin in the garden, God says to the woman, you will have severe labor pains and, quote, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you, end quote. Here, the word for rule from the Hebrew is mashal and translated in our English Bibles mostly as rule. Now, this word mashal can mean a lot of things. First of all, it doesn't necessitate a hierarchy of subordination. It's consistent with what we've learned so far. But instead of zooming in on the Hebrew here, there's something even more obvious. Here, this rule is a consequence of sin. It's not God's ideal for gender dynamics. Where else in scripture would we imitate the consequence of sin rather than God's vision for righteousness? That's like reading through the New Testament in Acts chapter five and reading about Ananias and Sapphira and then preaching in the church that we're all gonna be struck dead any time we're deceitful. It's a little absurd. This is a consequence a cautionary tale, not instruction, and certainly not being lifted up as God's desire. We simply cannot allow Genesis 3.16 to define our relationship with gender. If women are to have pain and childbearing and men are to work the land as a punishment, then why aren't we teaching that epidurals and landscapers are unbiblical? Again, a little absurd. Therefore, we read this text as a specific consequence for two specific people in a very specific scenario. Now, I mentioned Jerome earlier, and uh, not only is it my middle name, but St. Jerome was a hugely influential early church father. 
He took the Hebrew Bible and the Greek Septuagint and translated them into the emperor's language of Latin. Now, some of you have heard about Jerome's misleading translation of the word metanoia, which is where our word repentance comes from. Well, here's another difficult one to swallow. And it's been well documented that Jerome had some major issues with women. He bought into Aristotle's repulsion and he would hide his sexism as a stand for purity or holiness. He even cursed a woman's natural reproductive cycle, writing, quote, nothing is more filthy or unclean than a menstruant, end quote. In one of Jerome's letters, he writes, death came through Eve, but life has come through Mary. In fact, the first woman's name is not Eve at all, but it's Chava. Some scholars believe Jerome was creating a division between Mary, mother of Jesus, and our first woman here. So he named her Eva, which is a sort of palindrome opposite of Ave, as in Ave Maria, which means Hail Mary. My Hebrew professor would always say, translation is interpretation. So guess how Jerome translated Genesis 3.16. From his Vulgate, the Latin translates, and you will be under the power of men, and he will rule over you. You know, I love my middle name, but this guy's now making up words that didn't exist in the Bible. Quote, under the power of men, end quote, is an interpretation disguised as a translation. And by the way, his Hebrew was excellent. This is no accident. His sentiments about women became Bible truth, which became popular culture. Even authors like Geoffrey Chaucer, called the father of English literature, directly quoted Jerome on this verse in Genesis 3.16. Now, guess where they got the first English translation of the Bible? Well, John Wycliffe got it from the Vulgate. Written by who? Yes, yours truly, Jerome. Chaucer and Wycliffe lived a thousand years after Jerome. And here we are, another thousand years after that. But still, our understanding of the Hebrew Bible is influenced, even distorted, by the sentiments of men so long ago. Bad theology has a way of lingering for centuries, especially when the status quo likes it exactly where it is. Now, some of you might hear this and wonder, well, well how can we trust any of the Bible then? Do, do we all have to be Hebrew scholars to know the truth? No. But let me say, that's a great conversation. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with, you know it, gentleness and respect. So let's talk. Let's pray. Let's digest our sacred text in community together. Also, some of us have the great faith of the blind man. We don't necessarily need all the details. We say, hey, I was blind, but now I see, period. And amen for all you super faithful out there. We need you. But now there's also many of us whose faith is built by the reasons. And I count myself in that number. So here's the challenge for us all. Study on your own. This is a great four hours, but if your faith depends on it, get out there and confirm it. Here's a quick resource page of some of the material I've used to arrive at where I am today. As a warm up, consider the Genesis 1 through 3 podcasts and videos of the Bible Project and Bema. A little deeper, try Rabbi Foreman or Douglas Jacoby's book on Genesis. And waiting further still, read the ICOC teacher's book called The Bible and Gender, an outstanding resource. And one of the first chapters talks about Genesis 1 through 3. And finally, fathoms down below the surface, feel free to dig into Walter Brueggemann's commentary on Genesis. For some of you, this is old news. You might even feel that you've already figured this out. And I love that spiritual confidence. Just consider that there might even be more for you to learn, not only in mind, but in heart. To conclude, it is my deep biblical conviction that God made man and woman equal, both as images of the divine. The problem has been that in 2000 years of history, humanity lost the plot until it became commonplace for churchgoers to believe that women were a lesser form of the species that didn't deserve to have the same rights and shouldn't have equal voice, not just in the world, but in the church. Yes, sin has borne its consequences onto our gender dynamics, but that picture 
is a description, like watching the five o'clock news. It is not a biblical directive from the book of Genesis. Therefore, it is up to each one of us as equal children of God, each gifted with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at our baptismal regeneration, to reshape the culture to spiritual balance, to wake up from the lullabies of bad biblical reception, to anchor into the clear teaching of Ha'adam, Ezer Konegdo, Salah Etsem, and Mashal. The psalmist writes, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so may the same Yahweh creator God who made the universe shine a light to our path as the New York, New Jersey regional family of churches strive toward true repentance, respect, and righteousness. Amen. When I think of being made in God's image, I think of being granted participation in the divine. As a mom of two and now almost three, I am more grateful than ever to be exclusively included in this amazing part of God's plan for humanity. In a special way, we all play a role in making God's will come to being here on earth. So, when sin, hurt, disappointment, dissatisfaction, insecurities, pain, regret, fear, worry, and the rest of the world's lies want to change my self-image, want to distort who I am, want to make me lose sight of where I came from, I remember God. When I think of being made in the image of God, I'm reminded that the God who controls the universe, I am made by Him. I am His, His daughter, His creation, His poem, His workmanship. When I think of being made in God's image, it reminds me that I'm known, I'm seen, heard. Even when I feel unimportant, unseen, silenced, and inconsequential. No matter how loud the noise is, I can hear God's voice speaking peace into existence because he put a piece of his existence in me. In a couple of months, but what I'm sure will feel like remixed minutes, we will be welcoming a baby into our family. And not just any baby, a baby girl. And truth be told, as much as my amazing wife is the one actually feeling the twisting and stretching inside her body, I have never felt so many feelings in my life. I feel defensive and defenseless. It's like my senses have senses, and those senses have been heightened and then hyphened with frightened, enlightened. I'm already so protective of this girl, and she's not even here yet. I want to make her happy. I want to make her feel safe. I want to put her in a safe, in case. That's too much. I want to make her a castle with a moat and a drawbridge that will only be activated by the sound of her peace and my acceptance. I want to make her a lot of things. But right now, it seems like the best that I can make is a mess or mistakes. My wife, however, is creating life, contracted by the creator of the ever-extending ends of eternity to partake in the realization of existence. There is a universe in her womb, stardust settling somewhere near her stomach and Saturn's rings circulating the space between cornea and iris, and I wish with all the sum of the shooting stars that ever run across the sky that she never feels less important than gravity, that she always measures the gravitas of her existence in galaxies instead of grams, that she never forgets where she came from. And as much as I hope to impart the richness of my family's culture into her understanding of her place in the world, I am not talking about the implications of her maiden name but the implications of her made-in name. That she never has to look further than her own reflection for the evidence of the existence of God. Imagine if we all understood the image in which we were crafted in, engrafted into promises that are fastened by the same grip that's holding reality together as we speak. So please, 
little girl. Even if change values attempts to change values, remember that you have a piece of forever inside you.